Hello, my name is Tony Hyman. I'm a director of the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics in Dresden, Germany. Today I'd like to talk to you about encouraging innovation in the biomedical sciences. And I'd like to focus on how can we best support young scientists during their first independent career. So by way of introduction, let's step back and think of the following. Why do societies actually fund basic research? It's because of the understanding that basic research is often the motor for innovation. There are many examples of this, both now and through history, but a sort of pertinent example of biomedical sciences is the huge cluster of biotech and pharma companies in the Bay Area, which has been greatly supported by the basic research from UCSF, Berkeley, and Stanford. And I think we all understand that if those great universities didn't exist, it's unlikely that there was a cluster of biotech and pharma companies in the Bay Area. Another aspect of basic research is the understanding that innovation tends to correlate with youth. And here's one example, which is that biomedical scientists tend to cite innovative research topics earlier on in their career, and as they get older, it tends to cool down. Another metric we can use is to look at the Nobel Prize in Medicine. I mean, the prize-winning work for the Nobel Prize has been carried out on average about the age of 40, and that hasn't changed very much over the last 150 years. And yet, if you look in the American system, the age of the fast first R01 grant is now an average of 42. So let's look at those statistics a bit more carefully. This shows the percentage of young NIH investigators funded from 1980 to today. And you can see that in 1980, roughly 20% of the investigators were under 36, which gave about 2,600 grants. That systematically declined until now, we're at about 600, which is about 2 to 3% of investigators. And so we're systematically taking money away from young people and giving it to old people. Now, the NIH has used a number of different metrics to try and solve this problem, but so far they haven't really got very far, as you can see, in, in changing this overall demographics. So why do young people have so much problem? And I think it's because young scientists are always having to look over their shoulders. For instance, a key problem is misguided valuation metrics, such as journal impact factor and the citation index. These are not good ways to encourage innovation because, by definition, most of the innovative work is not highly cited right at the beginning. That tends to come later. A key problem is they're competing with senior laboratories for the same resources. Senior laboratories, because they're longer and more established, tend to have networks in the community. They have networks for the meeting organizers, to the, the journal editors, and everyone else who's involved in organizing science. It's often quite hard for a young person coming in compete with those resources. A key problem is that a young scientist needs preliminary data to get jobs and grants, and so they have to carry on with the work they did as a postdoc. And that, by definition, is not as innovative as if they could go and start something completely new in their own laboratory. And once they have their laboratory, they're in a constant data review, which, of course, leads to short-term research. Because if you want long-term research with lofty goals, you have to review over a longer time period. And why is this a particular problem is that it means that career and discovery now are becoming conflated. And scientists, especially young scientists today, are beginning to see their career as more important than discovery because that's what they're rewarding it for. So what I'd like to talk about now is some ideas that have come out of Europe on how best to support young scientists at the beginning of their career. And this is my own experience, which is I did my PhD in the laboratory of molecular biology with its many Nobel Prizes, and I, of course, got to see innovation in action there. Then I had a very good postdoc in the University of California, San Francisco, where I became sort of intimately uh, acquainted with the American system and funding before moving to EMBL in Heidelberg. Now, EMBL was a laboratory that was not only doing great research, but also was a laboratory for how to fund research, how to fund young people. And I then took the ideas from EMBL to help set up my own institute in Dresden, which was the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biology and Genetics. Now, why was EMBL such a success? It was because it had this new model for funding young scientists. When it was set up in the 70s, this was very radical at the time. The idea was to give young people nine years of funding and come back and see what they discovered. EMBL in Heidelberg has about 50 group leaders and a few senior scientists just to make sure there's a little bit of continuity. But fundamentally, it's a fishing pond for young scientists to come in, 
and do what they want. And we, the average starting age for a group leader since the beginning of the laboratory is 34. So these people have been given independent funding for nine years um, to get on and do whatever they want. Now, by any ma manner of means, this has been successful. There are group leaders from EMBL all over the world in successful leadership positions. And importantly, it's in the top 10 research institutes worldwide based on publication quality, even though almost everyone leaves after nine years. Why did it work so well? Well, one of the key things was it gave scientists the freedom to innovate, of course. At a very young age, they were given almost a decade of funding to do what they wanted. And that's kind of sort of the obvious aspect of EMBL. But there's a second and more important issue, in my opinion, which is that it separated funding of junior and senior scientists. Now, if you remember, I talked about at the beginning of one of the key problems that junior scientists face in a standard granting system is that when their grants come in, they're compared to more senior colleagues. But the EMBL system avoided that because basically it was only funding young group leaders who had to compete with each other. So a key step forward in European science was taken when the EU decided to set up a new funding body called the ERC. Now, the EU has funded science for many decades, basically under a contract mechanism where you had deliverables and milestones you had to reach. And that had been successful for networking scientists together in Europe. But of course, there's an understanding and that was too goal-driven. And so a few, few people then got together in the sort of early 2000s and started to think about how to fund a new science agency in which excellence was the only evaluation criteria. And this led to the foundation of the European Research Council, officially started in 2007, with a budget of about 13 billion. Now, the important thing about ERC was they set up this new funding mechanism, which had three sets of grants, starting, consolidator, and advanced grants. Now, this separated the funding into the different career stages. So the starting grants were about two to seven years after the PhD, and then came the consolidated grants, uh, which was seven to 12 years, and then the advanced grants. And the important thing about this, of course, is that each stage in the career can be evaluated differently. You can evaluate starting PIs according to the metrics you'd like, which is, do you have a new innovative idea you'd like to try out in your own lab? In a consolidated grant, you can think about, have they run a successful lab? And if so, can we then support this longer to get the ideas going? And the advanced grants, of course, is senior scientists who have a record, a track record of achievement, but would like to shift direction. And so each of these individual cases, you can provide different evaluation criteria. And this has been very successful. If you look at the average starting age of ERC starting grants, it's about 35. And over half of all ERC funding is now devoted to investigators within 12 years of their PhD. The question is, could you apply the ERC system to other systems in the world, and how would you do that? Well, in fact, many countries actually have a kernel of these systems to support young people. As an example, in the United States, there's the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, which is almost exactly the same as the ERC starting grant. It funds risky, innovative research within 10 years of the PhD. It's roughly the same grant size and duration as an ERC starting grant. The age is roughly similar, but only 40 to 60 are awarded every year. What you can imagine is adapting this US system to fund young people by expanding the Innovator Award to fund 1,000 young investigators per year. Now, how do we come up with the number 1,000? Isn't that rather a lot? Well, you can just do it by looking at statistics. Let's go back and look at our graph about funding uh, of, of age in different investigators at different stages. So there were 2,600 investigators in 1980 under the age of 36, and now there are 600. But if you take this number 2,600 and look at it, actually the number of investigators has doubled, so we'd actually expect 5,000 people in the current system to be under 36, but only 600 are. So if you think you'd like to get up to that 5,000 in a five-year grant cycle, you'd like to be funding roughly 1,000 every year. And so the proposal then you can imagine would be to expand the new Innovator Award system to fund 1,000 investigators a year, not 50, 
and this would give a steady state of about 5,000. The important thing is, if you do the numbers roughly, this is about the same amount of money the ERC is actually also putting into funding young people. So, and the EU has roughly the same number of people as the United States, so bring it roughly into parity with uh, the system. But the numbers aren't so important as to say there needs to be a system where most young people coming out of their postdocs are funded on the system where they themselves are evaluated according to the metrics you'd like to use for starting scientists with their own labs. This is not a new idea, actually. Bruce Alberts proposed it in 2009 in his science editorial. Um, he, but at that stage, you could say no one had done the experiment. But now the ERC's come along, I think that really has done the experiment to test what Bruce proposed at the time, which is if we increase the number of um, grants for young people, we will have much better at getting the hands into young people so they can get started with their own research. So just to sort of conclude, really, is that the root to innovation is well known. You have to take smart young people with a record of innovation during their training and give them the resources for a considerable period of time and let them discover something. Tell them they'll be evaluated on innovation. And of course, make decisions earlier. There'll be some mistakes, but there will be more innovation. Just to finish, I'd like to come back and concentrate on the point that, of course, innovation also requires freedom to fail. You know, science is about trial and error. One tries different experiments, they work or they don't work, and that can often go on for a, a few years. And Fred Sanger was a senior scientist in my a laboratory as a, as a graduate student at the LMB, and he won two Nobel Prizes, one for DNA sequencing, one for protein sequencing. And he was still there when I arrived as a graduate student, a very respected figure, and he liked to talk to the students. And one time he said to me, he said, Tony, you know what? 95% of all my experiments failed, and that's probably an underestimate. But of course, he still went on to win his Nobel Prizes. And a second important point to say is, let's take the bureaucracy away from young people. Let's not overload them with bureaucracy, because that also stifles innovation. And the last quote I'd like to finish on is from Max Perutz, who was actually the founding director of the Laboratory of Molecular Biology. And he said once that because of the success we had, you know, all these Nobel Prizes, earnest young men in those days would come around with clipboards to try and find out what our strategy was. And I would say to them, it's quite simple. We'd find smart young people, we'd give them the resources, and we'd get out of their way. So I think in general, Moving resources back to funding young people would be a simple and effective strategy to bring innovation back into the hands of young people. And importantly, I think, provide young people with the hope that they can go on and have a career in science and really make fundamental discoveries, which is, of course, the reason that we're all scientists. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>